Uh, I think though that uh, Dora has this impression about me the first time to hear this, so it's, uh, I'm very lucky to have the chance to, to hear her feedback about me. Uh, I can see her feedback from time to time from her eyes, from her behavior in terms of uh, dealing with me, but I never had uh, this uh, uh, impression about uh, what you have about me. Thank you. And I'm very happy to be here with you. It's uh, my pleasure to be always to, to be in Romania, in Bucharest. And whenever I hear an email coming from Dora, so I see her email in my mailbox, I know that, wow, I'm going to, uh, to uh, Bucharest again. So I'm always happy to be here. And uh, thank you very much for this uh, 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 magazine to invite me to share uh, what I uh, have in, uh, in, in terms of knowledge because I like very much to share what I know uh, with the people, with the hope that uh, sometime some group will make use of that. So, um, as you can see, um, I'm going to share with you three key words. Yeah? Uh, if you have noticed the title, uh, the title is about decision making, a complex context or complexity, and then system thinking. So, as you can see that uh, this title, I need the, the challenges, it's uh, in relatively uh, short time that I have here. I want to share uh, and talk about uh, these three concepts uh, with the hope that uh, you can really make use of that. Let us talk first about the first concept, which is the decision making. Uh, definitely, I'm not here to talk about the process of decision making because whenever if you Google decision-making process, you will find those enough uh, processes. Uh, you will find tools, you will find everything about decision-making. So I don't think when I, uh, I knew that I'm going to meet a group uh, like you, I said, okay, it's, I don't think it's about uh, telling you the process, the traditional convention process of decision-making that starts with the problem definition up to making action. So everyone can take that, can get it easily. It's available. It's known, and uh, you can pick up this very quick. So the problem is not about the process, in fact. It's always, it's a, the problem comes when we want to execute it. So it's about execution, not about the process itself. So that, I think this is all, uh, most of us, uh, they can really have, uh, read a lot of uh, good uh, books, good uh, journals, uh, good websites uh, about many concepts, the problem is always how to execute it. So I don't think I'm going to talk about the process, so it's uh, just to set some expectation here. Uh, but uh, the big question here, uh, because I'm always struggling against this, yes, yeah, Dora mentioned, I like very much statistics, that's why maybe she can feel my passion about statistics. And uh, when you have passion about something, everyone will get it. So, but always, uh, even when I go to Lima, Lima, I'm going to teach uh, DB students, Doctorate of Business Administration, about quantitative uh, research methods. So it's uh, always qualitative things. But today it's a qualitative day for me. So it's, I'm going to talk in qualitative terms, so don't be, uh, yeah, uh, or fear that I'm going to talk about numbers, and about statistics, forget it, it's not all statistics today. It's decision making using the qualitative thinking. I sometimes like to call it like that in order to be very close to each other. But in fact, you will see later on how I call or why I call it qualitative later on. So the big question then when it comes to decision making uh, is this. Are all of us supposed to make the right decision? This is the question that it came to my mind uh, and always comes to my mind, and I have answer for it. But I don't want to be biased. I want to hear from you. But again, in order really to, uh, to try to answer this question, you have to understand uh, how I'm going to answer this. So the issue is, in order to sometimes understand the world, you need for more or less you hit on the extreme point. Uh, why I'm saying that? Because before answering this question, think about it. Uh, in order to have an, uh, a view about it, then there are two extremes here. Either I will rephrase this question into two things, another two questions. What would happen to our world 
if we all make the right decision. Think about it. Imagine that we are the world here. We are the only one here. So no one else outside this room is living. We are the only one. And after you think about it, I will give you, by the way, a few seconds to think about the answer, to share it with me, and you see how you see it. How you see it. The, and the second question is, what would happen to our world if we all make no decision? So those are the two extremes. If you think about the consequences, or maybe the potential answers for these two questions, then you will understand why the world behaves the way it's, it does. So now it's um, try to, uh, to figure out what would be the answer of the first question, and maybe the answer of the second question. Can you do that? Can you have anything in your mind and say it? <coughs> I'm waiting. <coughs> what would happen to our world? Think about the first question. Any clue? Any answer? Say anything. Just answer. <laughs> Okay, one of the things is boring life. Yeah, do you agree with this? No. So, because everyone is doing the same thing? Wow, it's, we don't want that, right? We don't want boring life anyway. Means in a way that we are all equal? Yes, this is another, uh, another potential of answer. Think about, think about the answer because this is not what I want. This is exactly the start of the the bottom line answer, what you are saying right now, you are on the right track. So, but the bottom line, what would be the final con conclusion if we are all equal, <laughs> or even we, we have the break, we, we do the same thing. So no, we, we are not going to create anything. Then what will happen if we don't create anything? Life is boring, but what will happen? <coughs> hmm? It's self-destroying. Oh, that's... Uh, I didn't expect that, <laughs> but it's interesting because I want to understand why you reached this conclusion. Why you say that? What happened in your mind to reach this conclusion? It was a feeling, it was emotion. <laughs> okay, so you say, okay, if we do the same or the same right decision, or the right decision, we will self-destroy ourselves. Or? Or no decisions. Okay. Someone else wanted to share here? I have seen hand. Okay. So, so what you are saying, if we do, if we make no decision, we are going to die. Do you agree with this conclusion? Why? <laughs> Good things, not bad things. So see, it's an optimistic view. But here is the case. What, let us focus on the first question. What would happen if we make the same thing, the right decision? Boring, no creativity, no evolution, nothing. Life will stop. So life will stop immediately. It's like someone is pushing the button of, uh, of stop. Huh? We are in a video or an entertaining uh, or in a movie, but then you push the button stop. This is because we are all doing and making the right decision. You don't agree? It's not quite right if it's if going that way. But don't worry, we are not going to make right decision. <laughs> We are not going to, and this is the good thing in life. <laughs> so, but think about it. This is one of your exercises when you go home, think about it. Really, it's life will stop or not. The second question is when we do nothing, we don't do anything. The second one, life doesn't move. Because we do nothing. We do nothing, it means life will not really move. So that means the two extremes happening, they have the same almost result. Life will stop if we are moving, 
or we, if we are planning to move, we will stop, we will not move. So I think this is why it's, uh, we are now happy that we still make wrong decisions. Because we don't want really to life to stop. So that's why making wrong decisions is not a bad thing. So it's, life is about making wrong decisions, if I conclude it from my side. I might be wrong, this is why. This is how, I would not be right always, and maybe I'm, this is my wrong day, maybe, but still, I can conclude this. And believe me, I have, I have been thinking about this question a long time, and I tried to rephrase it in different contexts, and different form. I reached the same conclusion, life will stop, irrespective of how I reach this. I hope you can probe this sometime, Think about it, maybe you will be with my uh, thoughts sometime. So everyone so far is struggling and busy to make the right decision, right? Everyone wants to make the right decision. And, uh, okay, let them do that, life will stop for them. <laughs> so it's a, uh, here it's a, so today is what? Is, uh, whether it's about how to make the right decision, I don't think so. It could be boring things if I'm talking about this. So today is not about how to make right decision. It's about to make wrong decision. So this is what I'm trying really to make this contrast. Because you will, you will hear a lot about what the right decision is, the process and so on. But I will talk and focus more on, uh, more on the wrong decisions. Okay, so we wonder why wrong decision could be right one, why the right decision could be also the wrong one, and when the right is right and when the wrong is wrong. So this is also another uh, group of questions we have to think about it. So it's, uh, it is all about how the mind is working during the process. So it's not about the process, it's about how the mind is working. So I will just invest the next few slides about how the mind is working, why we are making decisions. Yeah, if, it's, uh, if you look at the mind, how the mind uh, works, you will find different view about, uh, because there are a lot of studies, a lot of, a lot of research about how the mind works. So whether from a philosophical point of view, or psychological point of view, or even from neuroscience uh, point of view, First, let us focus on philosophical view. Plato, he said that uh, he, he tried really to make a metaphor for our mind. His uh, metaphor about our mind at his time, that the mind is like a, a, a car or vehicle that being pulled by two horses. One, is very, one, one horse of them is black one, very wild, not well behaved, and the other one is well behaved. And the driver himself, he's the one who should control the car itself. So for Plato, it was, it was the, the, the model for the mind in decision making. His view was the following. The driver should always take control. And for him, in, the, in, the, in terms of his uh, vocabulary, the driver is the rational part, is the reason part of the mind. And the horses are the emotional parts. One is destructive, which is the black horse, and one is the constructive emotion, which is, and the positive one, which is the white horse. And the, the control, or the role, or the task of the driver is really to control the whole car, the whole journey. So, because he said, if you leave the horse's drives, that means our emotion drives, for under his definition, catastrophic situation will happen. That's why he tried to push the idea of rational and the reason should really take over in our life. So, from a physiological point of view, we had two definitely well-known names, like Freud, when he started to talk about the idea and the ego, for him, the idea is the factory of desire, the factory of the pleasure of uh, the human being. And the ego is the higher level that can take over, or at least can control the pleasure, can control the idea. 
So for him, the mind consists of two things, the ID and the ego. The ego is the rational brain. He said that it's a rational brain. So again, it goes with the same uh, definition of Plato, that the desire and the rational should take over. There was also a very famous uh, American uh, psychologist, William James, in probably in 1890, when he really said that, and it was really very interesting to see at that time people thinking that way, while they had no really technology, they mentioned that the mind consists of two thinking systems. Two thinking systems. One, system one is called the rational and the deliberate one, the, the one that you want to do it. It's rational, based on reason. The second system is quick and effortless and emotional. That means we have this conflict between which system should work well? So this kind of mix, it's our own mind working on that. That means we are not going to work only with system one, and we are not going to work only with system two. We sometimes have this mix. For instance, if you are, if you are uh, stopping on the street, uh, and uh, the car is coming very quick, you are not going to say, wait, wait, I'm, I have to switch on system one, because I have to think of uh, Rational, the reason, the consequences of being hit by the car. So then it's not possible. Then the system that's very quick will work is the system two. The system two that will immediately react. This is emotion. So, and this was, in fact, it was very interesting. And now in the modern science, a neuroscientific view, anatomically, the human being, brain, has a front cortex or area in the front of the brain that is responsible for our emotion and it was responsible for any decision we made. Can you imagine that we are still emotionally we make our decision even if we have the system two which is the rational one and they have proved it through operations. One guy at a certain moment, patient, had tumor in somewhere in the front, and he was very good in making decisions. He was even good at the successful businessman. And after the operation, when they removed this tumor, they would not be able, he was not able to make any decision. And when they discovered later on why he lost his ability to make decision, they found out when they removed the first part, the tumor, they removed the center of emotion. And the center of emotion was very critical for our making decision process. So that means, that's why I, tell, I told you, it's all about qualitative thinking. Even if we are going to focus later on, on some quantity, this is the quantitative thinking, it's much more toward rationale. But at the end of the day, our decision will be associated with the emotional part. So that means science said that, Philosophy said that, and psychology said that, that emotion very critical in our decisions. But it doesn't mean, my message is not that you make all your decisions based on emotion, but I'm saying that, that we have the two systems. So, decision making is, it is all about how we see our world and how we see our reality. So, it's a it's a, but in fact, we don't see our reality. Do we see our reality? We see it. Physically, we see it. Huh? In fact, I don't like to use the word seeing it. Uh, because if we're seeing it, uh, there will be another conclusion of that. Uh, we perceive it, not see it. This is the issue. This is why we are not making the same decisions. For When we look to the same reality, if we see the same thing, we are going to make the same thing, and then life will stop. But in our case, it's perception. We perceive reality differently. And this is why our brain consists of different things that perceive details differently. So because we, if we see it, it means we are all, or we live with that same reality, which means at the end of the day, we are going to make the same decision, and we know the consequences. Okay, visually I propose this, that we look at our reality. Okay, and everyone will see reality differently. But what is reality in this case? Reality is just an image 
of what? It's the image of the truth. We don't know the truth. Truth is always hidden. And the reality itself is like an image. So you might have your image to the same reality I have. But since I have different view, I see it differently. So that's why we make different decisions. Because we are seeing different levels. We are seeing different details. So we deal with image of reality. We don't really deal with the reality itself. It's an image. And this image of, of the truth itself. So how we see reality or how we perceive reality, we have a very important thing here, I call it the mental model. Okay? Our mental model is a group of beliefs, it's a group of assumptions, group of theories, group of values that I am really having that makes me see the reality different from you because your assumption is different from mine. Your theories are different from mine. So that's why our mental model are different and hence our view or our picture for our truth is different. So your reality is different from my reality. Okay, maybe I have to be close to you. So we are a blind photographer who is exploring the truth with our camera. I call it our camera is the mental model. So our mental model could be different. My mental model different from your mental model. It's different lenses, different power, different resolution, and different speed and different details. So we are not capturing the same thing from the same reality. So the one who has the best camera, I mean the mental model, most probably will have the better vision about the truth. And if you have the better vision about the truth, you should be able to make decision. And we are lucky we don't have the same vision. Because if we all have the same vision, what will be the consequences? We see the same truth, and then we will make the same decision, and then we will be the reason that the life will stop. So our focus now became on how, how to get the best camera. But still we need to interpret the picture. We have it in front of us, we need to interpret the reality because we want to make decisions. So then the chance for better decision may be. And our decision still can be wrong, can be right. Why? Because no one can guarantee that my mental model is the perfect model. No one can guarantee that my camera was the perfect camera. So probably with different characteristics of my mental model, I will see different details. So maybe I was biased to look at the reality from a certain angle, and someone else has the, uh, the ability to see other angle. So maybe we have different views with the same, for the same thing. Okay, the quality of our interpretation depends on the amount of details. I call it complexity. And I think this one will lead us to define the degree of complexity. And complexity was the second, the second uh, keyword of this presentation. So what I'm going to do now to define complexity, because if you look at the, the definition or the title of that presentation, I said, uh, if you, you remember, the decision making in the complex the context. So we need to define what does it mean complex context, or what does it mean the degree of complexity. Okay, according to complexity, again, you can look at uh, the Wikipedia, the simplest uh, platform to find definition. You can look to many, many dictionaries. But again, I want to make a uh, uh, workable and operationalization of one of the concepts like complexity. So complexity, according to the, the dictionaries, is something they are linked together, twisted together, and difficult to separate them. This is one of, uh, yeah, you can call this complex, it's component linked together. This is also another complexity. They are also small uh, particles connected to each other to give you this shape. There are other things like this. It's also another degree of complexity. that It consists of many, many variations and many, many parts that they are connected to each other to bring one object or to achieve one objective. So at this point, I will come to what I call it the complexity two-dimensional definition. For simplicity, I have two axes here. The vertical one, I call it distinction, and the, ver the horizontal one, I call it connection. And this will bring us 
to a very interesting view about complexity. Because complexity, it's, uh, yeah, what is distinction then? Distinction, it means correspond to variety, heterogeneity. So we how many people in this room? And how are we connected or not? Are we similar or not? How much variation about, uh, among us? So the more variation we have, the more heterogeneity we have, the more complex context we have. So it's not about just the number of people, it's about the behavior of each one. If we are different, then the distinction is high. If we are similar, the distinction will be low. So, but how, what's the degree of connected? Connection among us, are we dependent on each other or we are separated? And if we are separated, we will come to here what I call it very low or low area. And if we are very much connected and dependent on each other, I will call it high or high level. What will bring us this separation of this axis? The first part on the left, I will call it the area of isolation because we are not connected. What would be the next one? What will be on the right side? When we are dependent, we call it area of integration. We are integrated. That means my job and my task will be dependent on you and your task will depend on other one. So we are connected, we are integrated. So at this moment, on the connection level, we have two areas. As well, if we do the same thing for the distinction, for the vertical axis, we'll have two also halves. The lower one, I call it lower, low or very low uh, distinction, and I call it the very high and high distinction. What will bring us, what will be the result? The result will be the area of order, if we are having very low distinction, the area of order, that means there are some rules and some regulation that makes us in order. It makes us similar to each other. And we have another area, I call it the area of disorder. So at this moment, we can have the four uh, combinations. The area of order, the area of disorder, and the area of isolation and the area of integration. By doing this, we have the four quadrants. So, I would call this quadrant the perfect order. Why I call it perfect order? If you see it, you will find that there are low distinction and we are very much connected. It looks like we are following rules. So, even if we are different, the rules make us similar. So, this is the, the, what we call it perfect order. And you can think about army. Army, irrespective of how much variation they have in hierarchy, but still, they have to follow certain rules, very strict. That's why this is a model for a system that we can call it perfect order. Or like crystal, crystal is another perfect order system. Now if you look at the another quadrant, I call it the perfect disorder. Perfect disorder, it's chaos. It's all about, you have a lot of variation. Imagine this, we are all, all of us is doing what he or she wants irrespective of the effect of others. So it means everyone is doing in freedom, high freedom, everything, irrespective if this will, you like it or not like it. So this is what we call perfect disorder. And I think perfect disorder, yeah, coming from Cairo, I can tell you a very interesting model, and you can really imagine it, the traffic in Cairo. It's a perfect disorder. When I, I will tell you what's the traffic in Bucharest, later, you will discover, you can put it somewhere here, but I can tell you this, traffic in Cairo is a perfect disorder. Everyone can drive the way he wants. It's nice, or not? Yeah, but if you don't put constraints, we don't have constraints, oh, okay, we have rules, we have everything, it's written, but not being really applied. So everyone can really, uh, sometimes, last week, one of the, I was driving in one of the uh, busy road, and the, one of uh, the driver, he was really giving me the light everywhere. I told him, hey guy, this is too late, and you want to make third one in between, and you don't have, because the, the, you have a light that shows you that we have only two lanes, and after he, he, was, he got offended, because I, I tell him that it's wrong, he got offended and then he insisted to create third place. And then he asked me and he shouted at me and he said, this is not your business. <laughs> so it, it, the result is what? We had three lanes, 
for a road that only can take two, then we created a bottleneck at a certain point. And he waited like me, he waited one hour in the same road. So you can imagine that being do, or doing whatever you want without following any rules, this is what I call it the perfect disorder. Okay, we have, yeah, maybe we come to this very quick conclusion about complexity. Complexity is what? Is that you have, although you have high distinction, among the variables, you have a lot of variation, but still connected. And one of the best models is this machine. Whatever what this machine is, and what it does, but at the end of the day, it consists of many, many elements, but each element is dependent on the other one. And of course, we have the simplest one, low connection with very low variation. This is a simple system or simple life. Okay, so I will uh, jump to, this complexity has two types. And now you have to tell me where I can put the traffic of Bucharest in this. We have two types. One I call it disorganized complexity, and the other one I call it organized. Disorganized complexity it means you have high variation, no connection. Organized one, you have high variation with high connection. So where you put uh, the traffic of Bucharest? Any vision about it? Where you put it? The right side? Uh, the, which one? The, the organized one? Yes. It's a complexity. So definitely, I can easily say that Cairo traffic uh, is on the left hand side, this organized complexity, it makes sense. It's, it's, you can see it, if you come to Cairo once, you will be feeling that this organized complexity. I'm not sure, maybe Bucharest is in between. I don't know, you tell me. Any clue where you put, uh, or it's not here at all? <laughs> This quadrant, you can, can, or you can use these quadrants or two-dimensional things on yourself. If you want to describe your environment or describe your case, where you put yourself here? And then you ask yourself the second question, where I want to be? So where is the best quadrant, you think, based on you, I mean, on yourself? What would be the best for you? As a business uh, owner or, uh, or as a, someone who is working in a business? Hmm? Organized. So, organized because, yeah, this is, this is you. I cannot tell you in absolute, in absolute sense where is the best, but maybe this could be one of the things that this is the best. Maybe this is our objective. So now you have to define where you are. So, you mean you are in the middle? And then you try to organize it. Okay, so your case, you say, I am in the middle. Some people, they say, okay, my business or my life is like perfect order, but I'm not happy, or maybe I am, I am happy. But at the end of the day, I have to find a way to move to another quadrant. So this is very simple uh, explanation of the complexity definition. So, in order to make it more complex, we add the time dimension. So, if we add the time dimension, that means we have variation, a lot, of, a lot of parts, or a lot of variables, and we have the dependence among them. Beside the time, that means, I might be in one of the quadrant today, but maybe next year I will be in some other quadrant. So, the time dimension became very, very critical here. So this is the three-dimensional definition of complexity. One is the distinction amount, it's the number of variables we have, and the dependency among them, and the third one is the time, because the time tells us how dynamic our environment is. And at this stage, system thinking could be the method that we needed in order to organize our complexity. So maybe if we are somewhere in the quadrant, I think, and I might agree, that we are aiming to organize our uh, uh, 
complexity. So system thinking as the third keyword of today, I'm going to introduce it to you to see how this methodology could be very helpful to cap, uh, conceptualize the complexity and to try to find the connection because some of the problem is even if you know that you are in quadrant uh, organized uh, complexity, you don't know how to see it. You know you have a lot of variation, you know that you have a lot of connection, but you don't have the right tool that helps you to make them all, or at least to see the complexity at that level. Yeah, system thinking. This is the process that we always do in order, everyone is doing it every day. So what we are doing is, we observe things, we notice things, whenever you go to a street, whenever you go to a new country, or whenever you go to a new environment, you always observe. But based on the observation, you start to think, what does it mean, my observation? And then you build a certain theory, you theorize, you put theory, and then you say, okay, if my theory is right, then I can claim I'm understanding my reality, then accordingly I make decisions. This is the process. I observe, I think, I put theory, and then I make initial understanding. Then how can I know if my theory is wrong or right? How can I do that? We have only one tool that the human being is always doing it. It's the trial and error. Trial and error. You have to try your uh, proposed action in this case, you propose decision in order to make sure or to understand if your decision is right or not. In fact, you don't want to know if your decision is right or wrong. All what you are trying to do is to test if your theory is right or wrong. So, at the end of the day, after you make several trials, you might reach a certain situation whereby you say, okay, now I understand the world. Then this, this process can go more and more until you find out that now I can claim that I understand. So you update the understanding from time to time. So, this is the process, it's a very simple, you observe, you think, you theorize, initial understanding, trial and error, update, look at the result, look at the consequences, and then you say, okay, now I am wrong, I have to repeat it again, observe again, put new theory, try another scenario, and then look at the consequences. If it works, then you are on the, probably on the right track. I cannot tell you if it's right or wrong, because a lot of us making decisions, we think if they are, my, our decisions are right, but maybe it's by luck. It's not because I'm understanding the reality. It happened because the other people made it happening, not because I am understanding the reality. Okay. At this case, yeah, look at the, um, the, the physician. Any physician or any doctor, medical doctor, has the opportunity to look at the most complicated system around us, which is the human being. So, but they have technology, they have the X-ray, they have the MRI, they have the ultrasound. The ultrasound can look at a certain perspective, and the um, MRI can look at another perspective. So each perspective can bring a certain view and then a certain type of information that the doctor can process and then make a medical intervention. So this is how they do it. They do it because they have equipment, they have technology. What about us in the business and management? Do we have X-ray? It would be a dream if we have a machine named or labeled X-ray. Before you start your year, you say, okay, I will push the bottom, I will get a picture about the X-ray of my business or X-ray of my environment. And then if I know it, I look at the weak point, I take intervention and then it will be great. So that would be dream to have the X-ray. So how to see complex in reality, how to deal with it? We need tools and we need uh, in, in order to intervene on the timely and, uh, and the, the right moment. So I am claiming at this moment, system thinking could be the X-ray. No, no, no. It's the ingredient of the machine that will picture or make the image of your business. I will show you how the system thinking is working, and I hope you will make it, or maybe we can do something uh, together today. It depends. So. I will share with you a very famous, uh, when people teach uh, system thinking, they bring an interesting case. Probably it's very close to your heart. 
So, but before doing this, there is what we call it the policy resistance because system thinking can be used in order to put policies because you know government sometimes they make decisions, they put policies, and they apply it, but they have no vision about the unintended consequences. After they apply a certain uh, policy, they get a result, and after they get result, the result is good in the short term, but in the long term, the result became bad. I will show you a typical example about this. Okay, Romanian birth rate, it's a fact, some facts. The crude birth rate in late 60s was 15 per thousand per year. If you look at it on the 60s, the government had a challenge that the people of Romania increasing on that rate. 15 people per 1,000 per year. And they found out if they continue like that, the Romanian people will vanish sometime. Oh. So they made some sort of policy. The government imposed policy to stimulate the birth rate. Those are their actions. Those are their policy. One of them is, sorry, one of them is modest tax incentive for large family. Uh, in, importation of uh, uh, contraceptive devices was outlawed in order to make sure that we are going to increase. Propaganda campaigns praising the virtue of large family it happened. Abortion was banned. Those kind of policies they are um, imposed by the government at that time for one objective. The objective was simple. We need to increase the number from 15 to any number. And the surprise is, it happened. The number went up very quick to 40. Policy are working. Policy making effect from 15 to 40 per 1,000 per year. And not only that, the fastest growing nation then the government did its homework. Then you cannot really blame it. You can see that the government, the policy, were done. But birth rate began to fall within months. In the 70s, it reached 20 per 1,000. And in 89, it reached even 16 per 1,000 per year. The same as in the early 60s. The social system has resisted the policy. Why? The question is why. Well. And this was the behavior of the birth rate across the 30 years of Romania. This is the 30 years of birth rate. You can see at the beginning, at the 60s it was 15, and then after two years, after the policy uh, uh, deployment, you have the highest number, 40 per 1,000 per one year. And then it has been falling down till in 1994 reached the worst even number. So how the government at that time in 60s uh, has seen the birth rate working? How they have seen it? So maybe they just uh, make some action to get short term result. And they got short term result, but on the long term it was not good. What happened? So the question, if you see behavior like this, you come up to the question, let's say, what happened? And not only that, look at the consequence. Alternative method for birth control, it was used. And not only this, health problems led to increase in death rate. So it was not just the policy brought a very short term result, but later on, not only the birth rate went uh, uh, down, but also the death rate increased. So that means there was some sort of conflicting policy there was some sort of short-term view, not the bigger view. So then, from system thinking perspective, I will show you this very simple way to think about what's happening. So, very simple, we are here looking for the cause and effect. Because most of the time in system thinking, we are only talking about cause and effect. What causes population to increase? Very simple, if you look to any kind of studies, it's definitely, you can increase birth rate. So increasing birth rate, what will happen for population? Will increase. So, now, from now on, our own language, it's just a thing, it will be graphical. So what we are doing right now is trying to use the graphical notions in order to explain what's happening. So when birth rate increase, population increase. That's why we put positive sign here. This is part of the language of system thinking, is to look at the cause and effect. But what would happen for population if it increase? Because 
I have to tell you what does it mean birth rate. Birth rate is number of people per year. The, amount, the number of people born, the new people come to my system every year. So the people, the, when population increase, birth rate increase, because the more people I have, the birth rate, the more people will get born later on with some delay in the system. So this kind of feedback, the government didn't see it before. They say, okay, when birth rate increase, population increase, but what will happen if population increase, birth rate will increase again. And this will build what we call a reinforcing feedback loop. And this reinforcing feedback loop, sometimes good, sometimes bad. And this, what we call it, is a positive feedback loop. So in system thinking, we have one, two feedback loops. One of them we call it positive feedback loop. And the positive feedback loop, do you know how could be the behavior of the system? If this feedback loop is only working with no other variables in my system, if population increase, birth rate increase, and when birth rate increase, population increase, what will happen for population? Will increase forever. If we have, it would be nice if you have your uh, money uh, in, uh, in your bank account increasing forever like this, right? So it's... Uh, the amount of money in your bank increase. So the, what's birth rate in your, uh, or population is your customer. If population is your customer and birth rate is new customer, we would be very happy to see customer increasing like this, exponentially. So you, you think of if the positive feedback loop or the reinforcing feedback loop will generate ex exponential growth, then I would be very happy to see my business like this. So what is your positive feedback loop in your business? You have to think about it. What is the feedback loop, the positive one? But definitely, it could also another positive feedback loop that you don't like it, like epidemic. Epidemic is another positive feedback loop. In this case, population will be the infectious people, and the birth rate will be the number of infected people per year, or per week, or per day. So that means, the system behavior will be increasing, and this is what's happening right now in the Ebola case. You know, they are increasing like epidemic. And this is a positive feedback loop. That's why the world is trying to really stop this feedback loop by whatever action they are. So then population increase, birth rate increase, we call this feedback loop as the reinforcing feedback loop. But population can decrease by birth by death rate. So when death rate increases, what will happen for birth rate? decrease. And also can bring that population, if population increase, death rate increase. The more people you have in the system, the potential people to die will be higher as well. So that means why? Because it's an absolute value, it's a number, it's a percentage. So that means the more population, the more death rate. Then what will happen for this feedback loop? This feedback loop, we call it negative feedback loop, or we call it a balancing feedback loop. So the, the beauty of system thinking, in that case, we look at the cause and effect, and we look at the feedback loops if we have. The most dangerous things, if we don't look at our reality from this perspective, we ignore the feedbacks. We don't know when the side effect will come to us. We just solve a problem, like if I have a headache, I will take pain relief today, because I don't have time to go to doctor to know what is the root causes. So I will take the Panadol or I take anything else in order not to get more headache. But I solve it. But I don't know whenever I use the, the pain relief all the time what will happen in the future. It's like someone is trying to uh, get more sales. If you get more sales, or if you want to get more sales, some people take this action. They decrease the price. Okay, decreasing the price, it will stimulate sales, right? But what will happen in the future? What will happen? What would be the side effect? Because this is a very important. If you want more sales, you give discount. When you give discount, you get more sales. But what will happen later? People will get used to discount, then they will not buy your product later. Because they see that once you are in this feedback loop, they will wait. So sometimes your sale will stop. So although you are going to get sales very short term, but in the long term, your sale will not move anymore. 
Why? Because you, are, you don't see the feedback at the beginning. You just want to uh, relieve yourself from the pain. What the government did at that time for Romania, they wanted to stimulate these uh, feedback loops. So they made their policy in order to incentive, they pushed the incentive, and the incentive, once they put the incentive, immediately the birth rate increased. But after a while, the birth rate started to decline. Why? Because people started to make sort of regulation or control on the births. So the birth started to decrease, and not only that, it's also the social system resistant. So that means from the government at that time, I will stimulate the birth rate by incentive. Yes, people went to it, they have it, but at the end of the day, they didn't take care of the birth regulation or the resistance of the society. And the resistance of society was really huge or bigger than the benefit of having the incentive. That's why this feedback loop that you see in positive, it worked at the beginning very quick. That's why the 40 happened and then started to decline. In meanwhile, for any, for any government, they should work on spending in healthcare sector. Why? Because they want to decrease the uh, death rate. This is what we call it, in this simple form, we call it causal loop diagram. Because it consists of cause and effect, it consists of feedback loops, positive and negative, that we never seen before. It happened that they are there. And business owner or business people, they don't know what are the feedback loops you have in your reality. And this is the most dangerous thing. And system thinking at this, at this level helps everyone to try to capture the dynamics in your business based on building a system structure like this. This is what we call system structure. And this is how we deal it again. We, as people, deal, unfortunately, with events. I, if I see sales going down, I react. There is no proactive life here. Okay? And then the events, or maybe group of events. I look to the last year or the last quarter uh, sales. At the end of the day, this is it didn't tell us what happened. And this, in fact, was the reason for having this uh, kind of behavior. The question is, what is the system structure that is responsible? System structure could be in this form. Or the system thinking that be responsible to create such a behavior. So this is the question, and in fact, this is where the decision maker on the, on the iceberg level, they see signs, they see symptoms, they don't see the problem, they deal with it, they deal only with the, the iceberg. But there should be someone who is going down to see what are the root causes for such a situation. And these root causes will be in form of the system structure or in terms of system thinking the causal loop diagram. So, in order to give you the very simple language, because it's easy, you can use it today, you can use it now, that it consists of causal link, which is, in fact, it's a causal effect between two. It could be a positive effect, that means if something increases, I mean, if you increase training, in, uh, in, uh, training investment, you expect performance to increase. And uh, this is a positive feedback. And if you increase price at a certain moment, sometimes sales goes down because the price, it's competitive price, it's really people will not buy your uh, uh, case or your product or your service. So that means in a positive link we have only two things, positive effect and negative effect. And we have another component, we call it, um, we call it feedback loop. Feedback loop, we have only also two things. Either one, we call it positive feedback loop, and positive feedback loop, it could be good, it could be bad, it depends on its application and its nature. And we have one is called positive feedback loop, and sometimes we call it reinforcing feedback loop. And we have another one, we call it negative feedback loop, or we call it balancing feedback loop. At the end of the day, we have something to look at it, because after we have the system, we need to find out how we are going to intervene in the system. For a doctor, 
when he looks to the picture of X-ray or MRI or ultrasound or to a signal or a data analysis, he will know immediately where is the weak point in the system and immediately will intervene. He is going to take action. And this goes as well to you. Whenever you try to build the system thinking to your business, you try to find out what are my intervention points. The intervention point it means the point that I'm going to make a decision on it, the point that I'm going to take action, the points that I'm going to put some strategy or some scenarios. You cannot do that without having system thinking here because we are looking at the things from different perspective, from the connection and not just separated. We have also very critical concept, we call it delay. You see here on the spending in health sector, after a delay, the death rate will decrease. So, as a human being and also as a professionals, we ignore the importance of delay in our life. So, there are no just-in-time effects. There is always delay in effect. The problem is we don't know what is the delay. So then, if you can see, we have the causal link, we have the feedback loops, and we have the delay in the system. So maybe our solution then, our language would be, why there is a problem after I build this picture? Imagine this picture will be bigger and bigger for your business. You might use it, and you might really build your own system thinking model, whereby you can look at it and then you find out that why I have a problem here. Maybe there is a feedback loop that I have to stimulate. Maybe there is a feedback loop that's working and I have to break it. So your language and your view to the reality will be based on the feedback loops. So the more you get acquainted with this technique, you will discover a lot of feedback loops and whether it's a positive or negative in your system. And here it will be your action. Your action will be based on the language of feedback loop. Then, those are behavior of feedback, different feedback loops. If you see the first one and everyone, I think they look familiar to you. The first one is uh, exponential growth up to the collapsing one. The last one on the right hand side below, it's, uh, we call it the collapsing system. And it, it is exactly the life cycle of any business, the life cycle of any service or even for any project. Now the question is, who is responsible to create this? If you know what would be the hidden structure that create this, then you will be more able to understand what's happening. And then you might really put your strategy, you might put your scenarios, you might put your actions. So the question is, what are the system structure behind this? I will take you through it very quick for each one to see how it, it goes. For instance, this is, as you see, the state of the system it could be money, it could be people, it could be product, it could be client, but at the end of the day, it's increasing. And in order to capture or to know why I have increasing of something like that, then you understand from system thinking that you have a positive feedback in loop in your system. Your homework is to capture it, and your homework to know it. So this is, a, Typical example of population and birth rate, and also typical example of this, debt outstanding versus interest rate. If you get, you borrow money from the bank, and there is an interest rate, then there, are, there are some interest due. So every month you have to pay something to the bank. So your outstanding will be going high like this. This is not what you want to see, but it's a positive feedback loop. So the one that creating these things, it's a positive feedback loop. And your homework is to stop it. Because this is not a good one. But you, if you want to have a, a positive feedback loop that is good for you, you increase that, your customer base. So this is a two examples. The first one, we call it the population birth rate. It could be customers and marketing and development. Uh, you make some sales. And this is a debt outstanding and debt it's the interest due. So this is how your debt is increasing every month because, you are, because of the interest rate. There is another feedback loop, we call it the goal-seeking one, and the, any goal-seeking feedback loop, we call it a balancing feedback loop. 
and it, as you can see, it increases up to reaching a certain goal. Once it reaches its goal, it stops, like uh, air conditioning. When you adjust the air conditioning to a certain temperature, once it reaches the desired level, it stops. This is a balancing feedback loop. Why as a normal human being, our temperature body is 37? Because our human being organs are working with the uh, balancing feedback loop. We are working all the time, we are balancing, we are a stable human being. That is why we have all the time balancing feedback loop. Negative feedback loop driving us all the time to be balanced. As an example for this, it's like that. You see the price, this price is, or here, the price is our, my price, and I want to reach the competitive price. So this is the change in price, and in order to reach a certain price of the competitor, this is the price war, all what I'm going to do is corrective action. If I take corrective action, I increase price. So if I want, if my price is lower than the competitor, then I want to increase my price. I cannot increase it very quick, I take it gradually, till I reach a certain price. So this is the price, this is the desired goal, and this is my price. So then, according to the gap between me and my client, uh, my competitor, I will start making some actions. And then, this is another uh, balancing feedback loop, and you know it. It's um, if you are managing your inventory, then it's inventory level, and this is the desired inventory, and you want to reach. So the gap or the discrepancy between what you want to, dis to achieve and what you are having today, this gap will determine the amount of actions you need. If the gap is high, I will make more action. If the gap is small, I will make less action. So this is the dynamic, this is the reflection, this is the capture of the dynamic of your business. Another one, which is delay. The fluctuation in your business, it means you have some delay in your business. Delay in measuring things, the delay to take action, the delay the action will take effect. All these types of delays are the responsible factors for producing fluctuation in the business. So whenever you see fluctuation, you know that there are some delay in, the, in your system. And your homework is to capture the delay. You know where are the delay coming from. Once you know the delay where, where are coming from, you might make some actions to, to, uh, to decrease it, but nothing for free. Decreasing delays will cost you money as well. So you have to know which delay I want to decrease. So whenever you see fluctuation, you think, oh, I have something. Fluctuation around a certain goal, it means you have a delay in your system. So, and this is one of the things, again, if the inventory, why the inventory in many companies, they are fluctuating. Why? Around a certain benchmark, around a certain standard, around a certain reference around certain desired goal. Why it fluctuate? Fluctuate because there are some delay to measure. Some delay to measure the first, the first delay, as you see here, the first delay here, the delay that to measure where my inventory is. The second delay is to take action. So maybe I'm taking too much time to take action. So maybe there is a hierarchy in my business that I have to take approval, and this approval process will take more time. Not only that, when I give the, uh, the sign to produce, the production will take also time. So I have a lot of delay in my system, and your homework is to capture from where my delay comes from. So, and here it's another uh, S-shape, and everyone has S-shape in his business. Something going up, and then it stops somewhere. And this is because of this system. And the, this is, could be the population, and you can imagine this, population increase, birth rate increase. And this could be your customer, this is customer base. Customer increase, but again, whenever you get new customer, you are going to use resources. And if you are taking resources, you try really to, to slow down your business. Can you imagine, did you do that before? When you try to find out that your business is going too quick, Sometimes you have to take the action to slow down. Why you have to slow down? What would happen if you don't slow down? If you take, it's good for any business man 
and business owner to see his customer base or business increase in trust. But is this good or bad sign? Hmm? Because of the resources. That's why some people, they take action very quick. They slow down business. Because if you don't slow down business, I will show you later on, they will collapse very quick. Why? Because whenever you have resources for new customers, you take some energy from your reserve. Look on the nation level. The more people you have, you take resources. These resources could be food, it could be energy, it could be anything. You have reserve. It could be currency, foreign currency. It could be anything, but you have reserve always. Any business has to think of you, of the reserve, not only nation. Why? Because you are going to know later on, if you don't take care of your reserve, you are going to collapse. And you cannot really get it without really building a system thinking model like this. So here it's the case. Once you reach a certain moment where you start to get from your cash or from energy, then the system will be really going toward a collapsing mode. This is an uh, example for this. This is, of, of course, once you, you have some delay, the delay will be the, uh, the reason for creating this fluctuation. Uh, again, this is the most, uh, yeah, this is the one that I'm referring to that uh, could happen that once population increases a certain level, you take, whenever you have more people, you produce, you get more resources. You consume from the resources. Once you start to take from your reserve, then it means your reserve will be declining. And if you don't find any replacement for your reserve, this is the behavior of, of the business. The business goes very good at the beginning. Everything will be happy. And then, because of uh, some competition, the increase rate starts to decrease, so you reach a peak point. But after a while, since you don't take care of your reserve, you start to take up from your reserve. Once you take from your reserve, you start to damage. Once you, uh, once you decrease, then the system it goes bankruptcy. So that's the pattern, and this is your homework. Definitely, you don't want to see this happening. Right? So what would be your action then? If you know, if you are going to the certain situation and you know your business is moving like this, let, let us take a business case again. No. Yeah, imagine this population for you like customers and birth rates new customers. And this is the percentage of growth. That means 10%, 12% every year. And this is the resource adequacy. It means the more customer you get, the more resources you have you need. But these resources will always be backed up by the reserve that you have in your business. If everything goes well, you will not touch your reserve. But the moment that you touch your reserve, in this case the cash sometimes, and your resources, then you will start moving down because you will not have enough resources later. So you get more business, but you don't have resources. So you start to give up your business. And once you start to give up your business, because it's more than you need, then your business goes down. And this is exactly the explanation why a lot of business go bankrupt. Because they don't take care of their reserve here. Then if this, you know from now, it will happen more today or tomorrow, or maybe next year. What would be your action? What would be your intervention point here? What are the action, the scenarios that you take from now? Because you don't want this to happen. Then, tell me what would be your idea. Any idea what to be done here? So now try to find where is the intervention point. As a businessman, if this is my business, and this is what happened, I have to take action. But at which point I will take action? Which value from those things? I have to make something. Hmm? Yeah, if, if uh, then one of the things I have to take care of is really to look at the carry capacity. Carry capacity is the reserve. I have to move it up. Move it up, it means what? Either taking 
money from the bank, or I have to sell my business to someone else who wants my carrying capacity, or uh, I merge. So a lot of actions I have to take in order to lift up the carrying capacity. So at this moment, I can make this. Refill the reserve. Those are your intervention points. You have only two intervention points here. Either to slow down your actions, that means you don't take every business, you have to be selected. In meanwhile, you have to, to refill your, uh, your uh, carrying capacity or your reserve. Either by R&D or maybe by buying assets or by anything else. So this is all what you can really risk your business from bankruptcy. It's you think proactively from the beginning that if you don't want to have this collapsing system and you want to grow, you don't want really to grow for short term and then you collapse afterwards. And this is a model that can, generic model that explains a lot of collapsing business. So this is the model and this is an example in fact, I will not take much time from here, yeah, because it's uh, I can uh, really. This is a very a simple model that uh, can take uh, a lot of discussion. But this is one of the example that I'm saying is having business here, customers, customer acquisition rate, and this is the percentage. This is the business development effort. This is the marketing. This is the sales effort. It increasing the business customers, but the more customer you have, the more consumption of resources you need. So if you don't have, you take business, but you don't have uh, resources, then the system will collapse. So your reserve could be your human resource, your reserve could be in form of assets, could be for patents, or the experience of your staff, or physical money, cash. If you don't have cash, you will not be able to finance your new business. Then the only thing is refill your reserve and slow down your business. This is the whole thing of how to look at the system dynamic. So system thinking. So here it's one example of how to look at your business from system thinking. So at this point, I think I will stop because I don't want to really uh, go. There are some other things very quick. It's called, uh, yeah, this is uh, how there are some other uh, system archetypes. And I will give you just uh, some references if you want to go more into details on that. System thinking definition. Uh, definitely, it's uh, to see the holes, not uh, to see, I mean, to see the whole thing. It's a holistic view. And also, you can apply it in everywhere. You can apply it on organization level or nation level. And even personal level. Uh, i give you the last thing. It's uh, the uh, references in case of you want to have... More. Yeah, there is uh, something called the system uh, archetype. And this is what we call it causal loop diagram, as I mentioned. And this is the system thinking concept. Uh, the guru of this area, his name is Peter Sengen. So you can uh, get his uh, name, uh, or you can find a lot of books about his uh, work. He's very uh, famous in this area, Peter Sengen. He wrote a very interesting book about uh, system thinking and uh, organization learning. And uh, the, there are some other uh, yeah, he was talking about the leveraging of decision making, not about problem solving. And system archetype. System archetype is like a template, that business, that system that can happen in every situation. So, uh, there is a system archetype called fix that fails. And this is where you solve the short term only problem. And there is something called shifting the burden, that means you you solve the symptoms, you don't solve the fundamental problem. And then it grows, that this is exactly what we talked about it later. And the trust of the common, it means like uh, everyone is going to the same market. And once you go to the same market, it will uh, shrink some time. So this is the trust of the common. 
Uh, one of uh, the books that I really uh, suggest uh, called Business Dynamics System Theory and Modeling for Complex Model. The book was written by John Sterman in 2000, but it never changed. It's the best book in this area. If you want to go in uh, more in depth in this, you will find this book. It's very interesting. If you want softer books, uh, this book is uh, nice. Uh, the Art of System Thinking and also another book by Robert Cavana and Mann, Calabese Mann. So those names, I think they would be very good introduction to your business, because most of them they are talking about business case. Uh, yeah, and at this point, I think I finish the, the discussion uh, to introduce uh, about decision making. Yeah, in the complex uh, you know, uh, uh, context, with the complexity, level complexity, and we use the system thinking as a method to uh, look at the complexity of the system. So at this point, uh, thank you very much for being at this moment after the lunch. It was tough uh, uh, subject, not easy, but thank you very much. Yeah, if anyone uh, wants uh, to drop a question now, Anything or comments that would be yeah, my pleasure to ask. Okay. So it's a sign of tiring, <laughs> being tired. Yeah, okay. So, but uh, you will see later on my email. Uh, whatever uh, you want to communicate with me, please uh, do it. Thank you, and uh, see you sometime again in uh, Bucharest.